A Song of Ice and Fire is a huge, complicated story, with literally thousands of characters, 22 of whom are named John. so it's fair enough that the show, Game of Thrones, had to simplify things a bit by cutting and combining many characters. It's a shame though, because many of even the minor characters have heaps of really cool backstories and connections and layers to them that add a lot to the series. A good example is Thoros of Mir. We know him in the show as a member of the Brotherhood Without Banners, the outlaw group who capture Arya, Gendry, and Hot Pie in Season 3. The leader of the Brotherhood, Beric Dondarrion, is killed by the Hound, but then Thoros resurrects Beric using the power of the Red God, R'hllor, which may foreshadow a certain other Red Priest resurrecting a certain Jon Snow, not to name any names, but anyway, that's basically Thoros' role in the show so far. But in the books, there's more to his story. Thoros was born in the city of Mir. He was the youngest of eight children, so his father gave him to a temple of R'hllor, where Thoros was trained to be a red priest. He prayed the prayers and spoke the spells, and did sometimes see visions in flames, but he wasn't much of a believer, being more interested in food and women. Eventually, he was sent to Westeros to convert King Aerys Targaryen to the faith of the Red God. The temple figured that since Mad Aerys infamously loved fire, he might like the Lord of Light, but Thoros failed to convert Aerys. When Aerys was overthrown, Thoros became bros with the new king, Robert Baratheon. There were peas in a pod, both gluttons and sots, who loved eating and drinking and whoring and fighting. Thoros would fight in tournaments with his sword alight with wildfire, and he fought in the Greyjoy Rebellion, setting Ironmen afire with every slash of his flaming sword. So he sounds like quite the warrior, but in the same way that Bobby B is a pretty shitty king, Thoros is a pretty shitty priest. Tywin calls him a fat jape, and Gendry's master Tobo, who sells Thoros the swords he sets afire, calls him a fraud, and as bad a priest as there ever was. Thoros apparently gives up on trying to convert anyone, and he doesn't seem to even believe in R'hllor anymore. But all that changes in the War of the Five Kings. In Book 1, the mountain, Gregor Clegane, starts brutally raiding in the Riverlands. So Ned Stark, acting on behalf of King Robert, orders a group of men to go stop him. The group is led by Lord Beric Dondarrion, and includes about a hundred men, including Thoros. So the men go after the mountain, but at the Mummer's Ford, they're ambushed. The whole thing was a trap designed by Tywin Lannister to get Ned. The only reason it didn't work was because Ned couldn't come because Jaime injured his leg. So anyway, the group is smashed by the mountain's men. Some of them manage to escape and regroup, but Beric is mortally wounded, with a lance run through his chest. Thoros, distraught over his dying friend, performs a death rite of the Red Priests called the Last Kiss, breathing fire into Beric's body. To Thoros's shock, the dead man shudders, his eyes come open, and Beric is brought back to life. This causes a religious reawakening for Thoros. He says the Lord of Light has woken in his heart. As the remnants of Beric's men regroup, Thoros converts them to his rediscovered faith, binding them together as a holy brotherhood sworn to serve their realm, their god, and each other. Even after King Robert dies, the brotherhood fights on in his name, protecting the common people from the ravages of raiders like Gregor. They fight a guerrilla war against the Lannisters in the Riverlands, striking suddenly, then vanishing back into the woods. Thoros fights in these battles with his flaming sword, he sees visions in his flames of the future, present, and past, and he resurrects Beric five more times, as he keeps dying in his fights. Thoros is convinced that he's an instrument of God, he's finally doing something with his life that he believes in, and it changes him. When Arya first sees Thoros with the Brotherhood, she hardly believes it's him. She remembers the Red Priest as fat, with a smooth face and a shiny bald head. But now Thoros has a droopy face and a head full of shaggy grey hair. Thoros says that a year in the wild has melted the flesh off him, that he is less than he was, but more. This change in appearance mirrors the change in his character, from a glutton and a sot, a fat joke of a priest, to a man filled with righteous purpose and faith. But his story doesn't end there. In the last Brienne chapter of Feast, we hear that Beric Dondarrion has died a final time, giving his flame of life to the dead Catelyn Stark, who rises as Lady Stoneheart. Stoneheart is totally different to what Catelyn was like alive. She's vengeful, hateful, completely without mercy, 
and as the new leader of the Brotherhood, she begins a brutal campaign, killing everyone who's in any way connected to the Red Wedding, even people who weren't really responsible, like Peter and Merritt Frey. She even hangs Podrick, though Pod is apparently still alive, so don't worry, but the point is that under Stoneheart, the Brotherhood does some fucked up stuff. Under Beric, they would always give their captives a trial. They won't kill a man unless something's proved against him. But Stoneheart will hang anyone who she deems guilty. Thoros loses his belief that what they're doing is just. He loses his belief in himself, calling himself a pink pretender, a bad priest and a worse wizard. He sees the Brotherhood, his Brotherhood, deteriorate from something noble and righteous and holy to something crueler and darker. He says that war makes monsters of us all. So, where can Thoros go from here? Maybe Thoros could just leave, kind of like the Hound did. The popular gravedigger theory suggests that Sandor Clegane is not dead, but living a life of peace and atonement as a monk on the Quiet Isle. Maybe Thoros could do something similar, maybe go back to a red temple in Essos and atone for his mistakes. Alternatively, he could try to finish what he started, maybe try to put the Brotherhood back on a righteous path by killing Lady Stoneheart. Thoros, after all, is a fire priest with a flaming sword, and the undead in this story generally are vulnerable to fire. Trying to kill Stoneheart might risk Thoros' life, but he might think it's worth the sacrifice. Thoros tells Brienne that it does not matter how a man begins, but only how he ends. Sacrificing himself to kill Stoneheart could make a great ending for Thoros, a dramatic act of selflessness by a formerly selfish man. So it could go a bunch of ways, but the point is that Thoros is a really fascinating character, someone who transforms from a drunken warrior to a righteous priest to a man again filled with doubts about what he's become. It'll be great to see how his story ends in the books. He might even turn up again in the show, we'll have to wait and see. It's not clear if the show will include the whole Stoneheart thing. By the way, this artwork of Stoneheart was created by Ertach Altanoz. You might like to check out his DeviantArt for more. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. Many thanks to all supporters on Patreon, including Reverend Zandria, Mr. Fifa SA, Cameron Weiss, Vanya Dog, Michael Appel, Jason Ratra, Eric Bakura, Sheila M. Tierney, Akash Partha Sarathi, Fancy Ams, Karen Granstrom, Ben Greenhagen, Mark Raymondi, Ms. Louises, Guillaume Lejeune, Rude Lipper, XXX, Nadex Cute, XXX, Magia Nicola Timia, Freya Donkaslut, Podrick Targaryen, Lorenzo89, Angelica Saunderson, Brad Smalley, Dali, Jamal, Greg, and Bob. Thank you again, and see you next time.